do, um, we muted you all. So if someone has a question, um, so that's not a problem. Just raise your hand or send something in the chat. So I will know that you have a question. And from time to time, obviously, we'll stop them. We'll do stop share so we can um, have some kind of a discussion. So what I would like to do, I saw that this is really the class that I have with you before Shavuot. I don't have another class with you before Shavuot. So I decided to take, uh, to take something that uh, and I did here. Report, but also relates to uh, some of what I will call the fundamentals of our um, of our emuna and our Torah learning. So I called it or I titled it Cherut Shivion Vekfiya Yesodot Amapecha Yudit, which is which means freedom, equality, and coercion, which are the fundamentals of the Jewish revolution. Now, what does that mean? So first and foremost, I would like to read with you a known Gemara in Shabbat that we all know, we all quote, but I don't think that we fully understand it, and B, I am not sure that that should be the only source that we should consider. And uh, the Gemara is in uh, Gemara in Shabbat, Daf Pechet Amud Aleph, you have it in the source sheets, and I'll just make it a little bigger so you can see. And the Gemara says the following, So the Jewish people stood at the bottom of the mountain, and the word Vayitiyatzvu, and that's obviously is being taken from, uh, from Parashat Yitro in Sefer Shmot. Amar Avavdimi Barchama Barchasa. So we are talking about an Amora from around the beginning of the third uh, century in Eretz Israel. He says, Melamed Shekafa Akadosh Baruch Hu Alehem et Ahar Kegigit ve'amar lahem. Im atem ekablim atora muta ve'im lav sham tehe kvuratchem. So Rav Avdimi basically takes the pasuk which says, What is, does it mean, Why do we need it? It seems to be superfluous. They could say, Why do I need to know exactly the geographical location uh, where the Jewish people stood? So Rav Avdimi says, it comes to teach you that what? That HaKadosh Baruch Hu kafa alehem et ahar kegigit. God, like in a way, created some kind of a coercion. He basically forced them to uh, accept the Torah, and he told them, if you accept the Torah, great, and if not, that will be your burial place. Amar Rav Acha Bar Yaakov, Mikan, Moda'a Rabba Leoraita. So Rav Acha Bar Yaakov, who was an Amora from the third and fourth century, says, you know what, here there is a wonderful excuse not to be punished. Mikan Moda'a Rabba Leoraita. What does it mean? Because there was a coercion, because there was um, accepting the Torah by force, we can always say, look, why didn't I do that? Because I never chose to, to accept it. It was basically uh, pushed through my throat. I didn't want it. So this is Moda'a Rabba Leoraita. But Rava says, Amar Rava, Rava is an Amora in a Babel, fourth century. He died in 352. And I'll tell you why I'm telling you the times, because I think it's very important, especially when it comes to Rava. So Rav says, even though Rav Avdimi said whatever he said, Hadur kiblua bimei Hashverosh. In the time of Hashverosh, which was really after the first exile and after the destruction of the first Beit HaMikdash, so in the time of Purim, they re-accepted it willingly. So they re-accepted it and they did it willingly. And therefore, Rav Acha Bar Yaakov your excuse of that now we have an excuse not to uh, accept the mitzvot or not to do them or not to be punished, that's gone. Why? Because the Jewish people re-accepted it at the time of Mordechai and Achashverosh. So now I would like to um, discuss with you this, um, this uh, Gemara and we will need to try to understand what's going on here. We see something very, very interesting. Um, is that First and foremost, you take an image of which could be explained very, very easily by saying that they just stood at the bottom of the mountain in order to tell you that the Jewish people really followed what exactly what God told them what, through Moshe, which was, was what? Don't come close to the mountain, don't touch the mountain, don't climb the mountain. So the Torah wanted to tell you that they stood at the bottom of the mountain. That's not a problem to explain the pasuk like that. But it seems to be that Rav Avdimi wanted to create some kind of a, of a scenario, which is a very scary a scenario, 
And also that does not leave us with too many options, which means God in a way forced us to accept the Torah, which is not flattering at all. And Rav Achabar Yaakov says, oh, and from here we also have a good excuse not to be punished. However, Rava says, no, 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 that's true. It may be went like that, meaning with that scenario that we were forced to accept the Torah for a while, but at the time of Achashverosh, which is, by the way, just interesting. Why didn't they say in the time of Mordechai and Esther? But in the time of Achashverosh, we reaccepted it willingly. Now, why is that so important? So I would like to suggest to you, uh, or maybe we should need to give a little bit of, uh, of um, background, historical background. Rava, as I told you, uh, as I told you before, um, was uh, in a surah. And where he was in Babel, he was at the time of the Sasanian uh, Empire. Now, anyone who knows a little bit about the Sasanian Empire um, knows that the Sasanians were very, uh, had a very interesting culture and laws. Um, Professor Yaakov Elman um, has tremendous research. He passed away in Honolulu, He was in YU. And um, he has tremendous resource and research regarding the Sasanian influence on the Babylonian Talmud. Um, also, uh, Professor Sakonda uh, also has some kind of uh, interesting reading of the Talmud Bavli through what he called an Iranian view. Now, obviously, I'm, I'm, not, you know, I'm not doing any coercion in terms of accepting it, but I think it's very important to know a little bit the history and to be aware. I'm not saying to what extent, but to be aware that there was almost no question, at least in my mind, there, there was some kind of a reciprocity of influence between the Jews in Babel and the other cultures around them, especially the Sasanians, who were well-educated and also had some kind of very similar laws um, to the Jewish law. Now, the thing is with Rava, we know that at his time, he had to confront two main issues. The first issue was what I will call again the external influences of the Sasanian Empire and other groups and subgroups of religious, um, um, religious groups that had their own ideas of God and Olamaba and Triat Ametim and Mitzvot and Providence and all of that, but also internally. Some of the Jews at his time, we're talking about fourth century in Babel, were basically were challenging rabbinic authority. Yeah, you know, nothing changed, as you see. From the 4th century to the 21st century, nothing changed. But their idea was, ma ohilu lanu chachamim. What is the benefit of those rabbis? They don't come with anything new. They don't change the Torah. The Torah is the way we have it for Moshe Rabbeinu. And look at the other cultures and the other religious groups. They are advancing. They are developing. They are doing things. They are priests. Their scholars are doing well. They are doing wonderful things. And you, rabbis, are stuck. And Rava, and you see it in many places, if you want, by the way, it's also in English. If I'm not mistaken, I think that article is in English. You can um, Google it uh, by Professor Yaakov Elman. It's called Ma'ase Beshte Ayarot, uh, A Tale of Two Cities. A Tale of Two Cities, which he gives basically the fundamentals of this idea that Rava had to respond. And when you look at Rava in the Talmud, you see that Rava has a shita, has an approach, which is A, fascinating, but B, very, um, very, um, I will say, very new. You see that Rava many times says, lo shanu ela, which means this case it's A, but in a different case, we need to apply something else. Also, he, Many times he says that Chachamim or Ilulanu, that our rabbis helped us because they developed this idea and this idea and they changed this law. And one of his most famous ones is that, you know, the Torah says, Arba'im yakenu lo yosif. When it comes to lashes, the Torah says that you need to beat him up 40 lashes. But the rabbi says not 40, but rather how many? 39. So you see the rabbis changed something in the Torah. Now, why is that so important for me to share it with you? Not only because of the historical background, but because I think it explains what Rava says. 
until Rava, until the fourth century, the idea was we accepted the Torah, and when we say when we accepted the Torah, I'm talking about Torah Shebikhtav and Torah Shebe'al Peh by force. That was probably the idea, that we were forced to get it, and we can't change it. We can't move. We can't do anything. Rava says, no, no, no. Hadur kiblua bi'imeya chashverosh. The Jews re-accepted it upon themselves willingly, and they also accepted the authority of the rabbis that received the authority from the Torah. As rabbis have the responsibility, the privilege, the obligation, the opportunity to do what? To continue on the Torah willingly, not just, just to do it, but rather to develop it. Now, I will share with you one more thing that I think is also very important. Um, on this topic, I have less knowledge, so um, I can't uh, quote you uh, articles about it. There are some which are interesting, but I didn't really delve into that uh, situation. Is that uh, at the same time that uh, we have, that we had yeshivot in Babel, we also had uh, Christian schools in Babel, which is very interesting. Uh, Christianity was also a minority in Babel, in Babylon in the fourth century, but they also built schools. Very similar, by the way, to yeshivot, lehavdil. They also had a, a rosh yeshiva. They also had students, but their focus was the interpretation of really of Torah Shebikhtav. They don't have Torah Shebe'al Peh. And we Jews were somewhat stuck a little bit with Torah Shebikhtav, and Rava is the one to start pushing more and more Torah Shebe'al Peh in a very, in a very uh, novel way. So the idea is, what Rava is basically telling us is that there was a paradigm shift in the time of Ahasuerus. No more coercion, but rather we accepted it willingly. No more excuses of not doing things, we accepted it, and we had really, um, to some extent, in the time of Ahasuerus, who basically had uh, this, uh, he, was, um, he was the king over the entire domain of wherever the Jews, the Jews were, were. So Rava says, from now on, it's not kfiya. It's not coercion. It's cherut. We chose to accept the Torah. And based on that, now you need to also listen to the rabbis that obviously received that uh, permission from the Torah to do kol adavar asher yomru lecha ta'aseh lo tasur min adavar asher yomru lecha yamin usmol that you should not deviate from whatever they're telling you right or left. And now on, that was the Rav's shita, Rav's, uh, Rav's approach that from now on, we don't deal only with Torah Shebikta, but we start to innovate with Torah Shebaal Peh. So before we go to the next, uh, next source, any questions? No, okay, good. So we will go back to the source sheet. And it says like that. So without Rava, the notion that we receive or that we sense from this Gemara is that we really accepted the Torah and at least until Achashverosh, a time of Achashverosh, uh, by force. However, there is another Gemara in Shabbat, just the same page, and it says there, Amar Ablazar, Beshah Shigdimu Yisrael Nasa Le Nishma Yatsta Bat Kol Ve'amra Lahen Migila Levana Ira Ze Shemalachay Asharet Mishtamshim Bo. Dichtiv Baruchu Hashem Malachav Gibor Yekoa Chosei Dvaro Lishmoa Bekol Dvaro Bereisha Osei Vehadar Lishmoa. We obviously have a contradictory, um, a contradiction to the previous source because this source basically says what? This source says that the Jewish people accepted the Torah willingly. Not only that they accepted it willingly, they acted like angels. At the beginning, they say, let's do, and only after that, let's hear, which means they said, hineni. So, and Hashem was so impressed. He says, mi gila raz lebanai razze, meaning who revealed that secret? to the Jewish people that the angels, the ministering angels are using it. So it seems to be that we're not talking about a threat, that if you don't accept it, I'm going to kill you. It's really, it seems to be so nice and, and wonderful that the Jewish people accepted the Torah without hesitation. So obviously we need to understand what is exactly the relationships between these two, these two uh, sources. Now, in addition to it, now we'll take a source which is a little bit 
uh, not a little bit, it's definitely more ancient, the Mechilta of Rabbi Ishmael, Mechilta of Rabbi Ishmael is a Tanaic source. What we saw before, we are talking about Amoraic source. We saw the third and fourth century, and we are talking now about Rabbi Ishmael, who was a Tana. So we are talking at least about 200 years uh, before, or even a little bit more, and there it says something else. Vayit Yetzvu, Nitzpafu, meaning they got crowded together, they, get, they gathered together. Melamed she'ayu Yisrael mityarin mipnei hazikin, mipnei hazvaot, mipnei areamim, mipnei habrakim abayim. So the Jewish people were terrified from what? From all the sounds and the voices and the smoke and the shofar that uh, was um, blown on, uh, on Har Sinai. And betachtit ahar, what does it mean in the bottom of the mountain? Melamed, it's come to teach you. Shenitla shahar mimkomo, that the mountain was uprooted from its place. Vekarvu veamdu tachat ahar, and the Jewish people approached the mountain, they got closer to the mountain, sheneemar, vatikrevun vataamdun tachat ahar. You got closer and you stood at the bottom of the mountain. Now, obviously, as, you know what? I'm not going to tell you. I want you to ask you, what is the, how does the Mechilta depict this um, idea of Ma'amad Har Sinai? If someone wants to share his thought or her thought, please raise your hand or unmute yourself. Is, first, is my question clear? Just not no, your Oh, they cannot unmute themselves? Uh, uh, okay. uh, everybody can uh, uh, open microphone to, to ask questions. Okay. If, not everyone needs to open up their microphones to ask questions, only if someone has a question, okay? It sounded like they were so scared. Uh -huh. from all this uh, Chavaya that they almost went under the mountain to hide. Oh, they... okay, not that. Even more than that, Jeff. It seems to be that this Midrash describes this entire event totally different. The Midrash says, the Mechilta de Rabbi Shmael, it's a Tanaic source, says no. The Jewish people were terrified. And they start moving. And the, when Hashem saw it, he moved the mountain so they will have a shelter. And then they themselves willingly got closer to the mountain in order to hide, which means the har was not a coercion. The har, the mountain, was not to force them. The mountain was not, okay, if you don't accept it, I'm going to kill you. Exactly the opposite. The Jewish people were terrified. And in order to calm them down, Hashem told them, come closer to me. It's like I'm going to, you know, to uh, spread my wings and you can uh, be under my wings and I'll protect you. So the mountain is now not a, a, a threat, it's a protection. So obviously we need to understand, now we have one Gemara that we all like to quote and we don't really, in my opinion, fully understand. Oh, coercion and the mountain and they will kill us. First, we have another Amoraic source that says that's not true. The Jewish people said Nasev and Ishma, even though, by the way, just based on the narrative, we know that Nasev and Ishma was said later on, not exactly before, but whatever, let's leave, leave alone the, the, the um, little bit the discrepancy in, in Shemot. But the, the better question is, there is a Tanaic source that says the mountain was a protection. It was not, it was not a threat. So what exactly happened between the Tanaic source to the Amoraic source? So I see this, someone asked me a question in the chat, so one second. The acceptance of the Torah by the generation of Jews in the time of Ahasuerosh was voluntary, but is not that still a form of coercion for later generations? Uh, no. The answer for that, Danny, is um, th the question was, isn't that still coercion for other generations? The fact that the Jews in the time of Ahasuerosh reaccepted it upon themselves, wonderful for them, shkoyach, but what about us? The, the thing is, is that very much like when you have a rov klal Israel or rov Israel accepting upon themselves something, this is really an obligation for eternity. So if I accepted it willingly, it's going to be willingly for all, all generations. Very good question. Hopefully the answer was good enough. Now, so we have, obviously, we have two issues here. Issue number one is that the Rav Avdimi, one of the most famous, really, uh, statements in the Gemara, is obviously being challenged by another Gemara, and also and by another Tanaic source, which seems to be that this entire event was protection and not a threat. Okay, so let's go back to the source sheet. 
and we will see that there is another opinion, obviously. Mechilta de Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai. Mechilta de Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai, again, a Tanaic source. And, oh, by the way, just one, one thing that I forgot to tell you. You see that the Tanaic source, Mechilta de Rabbi Ishmael, they use the Pasuk from Dvarim, from Parashat Vaitchanan, where there the description is Vatikrevun, and you cut closer. Not Vayitiatzvu betachtitar like what we saw the first one, that they stood at the bottom of the mountain. Here it says, Vatikrevun, which means what? Kirva. They got closer. Vata'amgun tachatar. So you see that the, 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 the sources picked a different pasuk to the megama, to the, um, to, um, to the idea that they wanted to, to push. So now let's take a look at the Mechelta de Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai. And there it says the following. Vayitiatzvu betachtitar. You see that they took the pasuk again from Shmot and not from Dvarim. So he says, Melamed shekafa HaKadosh Baruch Hu alayhem et ahar kegigit. Ve'amar, im mekablim atnechem atem et ha-Torah muta, ve'im lav kan tehe kvuratchem. Now this is very similar to what? To Rav Avdimi. It's almost, it's almost identical. Right? You see? And Amora from the third century quotes the Mechit HaTanaik source that he had, now, don't forget, everything is by heart. So he quotes it without saying to you that it's from Mechilda de Rabbi Shmael, but he deviated. Because here, you have a different thing. Be'ota sha'a ga'u kulam v'shafchu libam kamayim b'tshuva v'amru kol asher diber Hashem na'ase v'nishma. So because they heard God's threat and they start crying and they start repenting. Now, repenting on what? Obviously, we need to ask, what did they do? They didn't do anything wrong yet. Okay? And then they said, Na'ase v'nishma. Amar HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Areivim ani tzarich. So Hashem says, you know what? I don't believe you. I need guarantors. I need, uh, I don't know, entities, objects, people that are going to guarantee your obligation. Amru, so the Jewish people said, Arei shamayim va'aretz ya'arvunu. So shamayim va'aretz are going to guarantee us. Amar lahem betelinen. They're going to disappear. Amru avoteinu ya'arvu lanu. So our ancestors will guarantee us. Amalen asikinen. Now, what does it mean? Asikinen can be different interpretations, but let's let's leave it alone by saying that they are too busy now. Amru banenu yarvunu. So our children will guarantee us. Amar are arevim tovim. Oh, they are good guarantors. Vechenu omer mipi olelim veyonkim isadet oz. What does it mean? Isadet oz means what? You establish strength. Vein oz ela Torah, and strength is Torah. So how did you establish strength? BP from the mouth of Olelim Veyonkim, meaning children. Okay. So here we have a very interesting, again, a very, very interesting uh, Tanaic source. This Tanaic source, unlike Mechilta de Rabbi Ishmael, Mechilta de Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai, which by the way is attributed to whom? To what, um, to what uh, a scholar, to what school of thought? If Mechilta de Rabbi Ishmael belongs to Rabbi Ishmael, so Mechilta de Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai belongs to whom? Come on, come on, unmute yourself. Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva, very good, very proud of you. Uh, Rabbi Akiva, that's true, and now we have Rabbi Akiva versus Rabbi Ishmael. We know that Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Ishmael had major machlokot, not only behalacha, but also behashkafa, and Rabbi Akiva, Basically, Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai that probably developed some of the uh, attitudes and the approaches of Rabbi, Shim, of Rabbi Akiva, he basically brings this idea that the Torah was given in somewhat of a coercion. It's not so much willingly. God forced us to take it. And we were so terrified. And not only that we accepted it like that, we also put our children as guarantors for us. Now, this is a very, very interesting thing. Because, in a way, it accomplished two things. A, we received the Torah, and we were saved from death. But also, and then that might, uh, um, might relate to what you asked, is that, in a way, we obligated the generations after us to not only be guarantors. How can you be a guarantor if you don't accept it by yourself? So, in a way, we created this Veshinantam Levanecha already from the time of uh, Matan Torah. So we see another, yet another perspective to Matan Torah. So we have, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, we are not really uh, in a, a shiur frontali, so I could show it to you. 
but you can maybe see it on the, on, really on the, on the source sheet. You have Rav Avdimi and Rav Acha and Mechilta de Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai that they correlate until one point. With Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai, he says that caused, this threat caused the Jewish people to do tshuva and to guarantee the acceptance of Torah for generations where it's missing from Rav Avdimi and from Rav, um, and Rav Acha Bar Yaakov, which is very interesting. Why is it that the Amoraim deviated from this Tanaic source, which is really, you know, beautiful? Um, so we need to, to understand that a bit, maybe a little bit more. So now we have, in a way, we have, if I, I will say Persian, underneath that I will have Mechilta de Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai and Rav Avdimi. And accepting it freely, I have Rava in the time of Achashverosh, the Gemara in Shabbat Pechet, Rab Lazar, and also Mechilta de Rabbi Ishmael. So obviously I'm starting to see what? I'm starting to see some kind of a split regarding the vantage point of our sages on this entire event of Kabbalat Matan Torah or Kabbalat Torah Bemaamad Har Sinai. One second, I have another a question here or a chat. I feel it's perhaps it is both. Coming out of Mitzrayim still have slave perspective. Not for everyone to be on the same page. Maybe some saw it as a coercion and others as protection. Okay, very good, a very good idea. I will use that idea, but in a different way. Uh, basically, the suggestion was perhaps it depends on the people's perspective. I would like to say it's not about the people's perspective. I think it's from a divine perspective. But I will talk about that a little bit uh, more. Okay, so now we are going back to uh, the source sheet and it says the following. In Shira Shirim Rabba, now Shira Shirim Rabba is a bit late. It's a midrash that it's late. Uh, late, I'm saying it's more based on the Tanhuma. So we're talking about, you know, everyone who listened to my uh, midrashe shiur, shiur al midrash, which is on Thursday night at 7.30, we are learning midrash and we are learning different midrashim. So now we are in Vaikra Rabba which Veikar Rabbah is uh, an Amoraic Midrash in the 5th century. But uh, next week when we'll start Bamidbar, Bamidbar is a much late uh, Midrash, even though they are all called Midrashei Rabbah, they were not uh, written at the same time. This one is probably uh, Middle Ages, talking about 11th century, maybe even. That, when it, that was when it was um, edited. So, so here they bring the Midrash in Shira Shirin Rabbah, Madurat Vilna, and it says the following, that's a pasuk from the Shira Shirim, where it says that underneath the apple tree, I woke you up. Now, what does that mean? So, Darash Platyon Ish Romi. No idea who is that person. I think it's the first time that I ever heard about this person. Platyon Ish Romi. Ve'amar. But he was quoted, okay? You and I were not quoted in Shira Shirim Rabbah. Platyon was. Ve'amar nitlash har sinai ve'nitzav bishmei marom. So the mountain was uprooted and was hanging from the sky. Ve'ayu Yisrael netunim tachtav. And the Jewish people were underneath this major mountain. She'ne'emar, and he brings the pasuk again from Dvarim, v'tikrevun v'ta'amdun tachat ahar. So do you see a coercion? No. I see shade. Tachatatapuach, why would you go underneath the tree? Because you want shade. You're not, you're not afraid. You don't even looking for protection. You just need shade. It's something pleasant. Davaracher, another interpretation. Tachatatapuach orartich. Ze Sinai. That's the mountain of Sinai mountain. Velama nimshal betapuach. And why is that compared to an apple? Elama tapuach ze ose perot bechodesh sivan. I'm not, I don't know, I don't know agriculture. I guess apple trees are very fruitful on the month of Sivan. You can correct me if it's wrong. I, it doesn't matter. The idea is there. The Torah was given in Sivan. Why dafka a apple tree? Not why not almond tree, uh, orange tree, banana tree? Because every tree first brings um, leaves, and only after that, the fruits. But the apple tree 
first gets the fruits, the apples, and only after that the leaves. Kach ikdimu Israel asiya leshmi'a. That's also the Jewish people first said we will do, and only after that they listen. They said we will listen. Exactly like the apple tree, first fruits, and only after that the leaves. Okay. Why the leaves are like shmi'a, not now. Shneemar na seven nishma. אמר הקדוש ברוך הוא, אם אתם מקבלים עליכם תורתי מוטה, ואם לאו, הרי אני כובש עליכם ההר הזה והורג אתכם. What? Do you see what's going on here? Okay. This is something very interesting. I hope that I'm not the only one who is excited about it. So I hope you too. It's hard to see your faces. But um, I will say the following. Well, oh, now I can see almost all of you. That's nice. Not all of you, but I can see most of you. So... In Shira Shirim Abba, you will see that the notion that the Midrash push be, until they get to the last sentence, it's, it's a description of what? Of a wonderful event. The Jewish people are going under the, the apple tree, like the mountain, they have shade, they have fruits, it's wonderful. Until now, it seems to be that it follows the Shita, the approach of what? Of Mechilta de Rabbi Ishmael and Rabbi Lazar. And we are all so proud of the Jewish people that, you know, they accepted it willingly. And then, in the last sentence, what do we have? If you don't accept it, I'm going to kill you. What? They already accepted it. So it seems to be one of two things. And both of them are my theories, so you can accept it. It's not Torah Misinai. And if you, if you don't want it, you don't want it. It's fine with me. I would like to suggest that perhaps... One of two things happened here. One, this Midrash, that is Midrash Meuchar, as I told you, it's a late Midrash. Basically, the Ma'atik, the one who copied it and edited it, uh, basically, when he saw, here, when he saw Naaseven Ishma, he took this, this sentence, Amar HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Atem Mekablim Alechem Torati Muta Vimla Vareni Kovesh Alechem Ahar Azeh Veoreg Etchem. This makes no sense, because they already accepted it. So perhaps he just made a mistake in the copying. He saw the Midrashim, other Midrashim, and he just copied, and then he saw that and he put it in without thinking. Because really, when you think about it, it makes no sense. They already accepted the Torah, so why God needs to tell them, if you don't accept it, I'm going to kill you. They already told you what? Naaseh v'nishma. That's one theory. The second theory that I would like to suggest is that, no, this Midrash has no mistakes. Not at all. He has a message to send us. Both are needed. God was very happy that we said Naaseh v'nishma, but that's not enough. It's not enough based on the Midrash, the Mechilta, that says that he needs arevim, he needs guarantors. And at this Midrash, it says it's not enough, and I'm not interested in guarantors. I'm interested that you will accept it also by coercion. Now, why is it? Why, if, if I am willingly accepting it, why God felt that he needs to what? To force it through our throat as well. So I see there is a chat here, just one second. Uh, they accepted... Uh, but we are forced to accept Shebaal um, Probably not. They accepted Shebaal ah, Okay, so um, probably not because they accepted both. We didn't do this uh, um, uh, discrepancy between Torah Shebaal and Torah Shebaal yet. Okay, so now let's go back. So everyone is with me, just nod your head, raise your hand or something that I know that you are all with me. Okay. Um, let's go back here. Okay. In Masachot Ketanot Avod the Rabbeinu Natan, says the following. Yes, Shomrim, Aya yotze laem maim chayim min ayam, v'shotim betoch ha-gzarim. That's when they split the, when they split the Yamsu. So there are many Midrashim that talks about the wonderful uh, miracles and wonders that the Jewish people experienced. And there was like uh, good water that came out from the, from the ocean. So you know the Jewish people when after the splitting of the sea they had to walk through the Yamsu, so they were thirsty. So God gave them sweet water because the water from uh, Yamsu are obviously salty. 
וענני הכבוד למעלה מהם, and the clouds are above them, שלא ישלוט בהם השמש, so they will not be, um, uh, they will not suffer because of the sun, ועברו ישראל כן כדי שלא יצטערו. So the Jewish people, when they split the sea, It was not enough all the other miracles, they also had shade from ananei kavod, and they also had water. Abi Eliezer says, Tehom kafa alehem milemala, ve'avru bo Yisrael, k'day shelo itztaaru. What does that mean? Rabbi Eliezer says what? Tehom, what is Tehom? Tehom is the water from underneath. Kafa alehem milemala, He froze it in a way above them, ועברו בו ישראל, כדי שלא יצטערו. What does that mean? Is the כפייה was something bad or something good? Everyone is afraid to speak or what? It's okay, it's only recorded and being uh, broadcast on Facebook and, uh, and YouTube. So if you make a mistake, no one knows. It sounds, it sounds like it was good. It was a protection, just like they were uh, giving the sweet water and the shade and all that. It was another kind of protection for them. Exactly. It was shade. It was something that they will not suffer, that they will not be afflicted, that they will not feel bad about themselves. It was a wonderful thing. So again and again, we see what? We see an idea that kafa alehem arke gigit is not necessarily a threat. It uh-huh. can be something wonderful. And the Jewish people accepted the Torah willingly and happily and with pleasant experience. So how can we understand it? So obviously we can say, look, you know, different of opinions. <laughs> It's not the first time that something like that happened. But I think that there is something much deeper than that. So if we go back, oh, you can, can you see it? No, you can't. Okay, I need to share it again. Uh, okay. So I am going to skip this one just because of time. I see that we'll, this is an, another topic in that topic. So I'm going to skip it. And I'm going to go here. So our main question, the other one, the, the other source that I skipped, you can take it and think about it. This is uh, a little bit of a contradiction to uh, Rav Avdimi's opinion, and there is a way to reconcile it, so you can have some homework if you want. But because of time, I want to deal with our main question, which is how can we understand the need of both, which means the need for uh, accepting it willingly and the notion of coercion. So, Rav Kook, in Ma'amare Ariya, says the following. Atem ekablim et ha-Torah muta, v'im lav sham tehe kvuratchem. So that's, uh, he quotes from uh, the Mechilta, or from Rabbi um, Ishmael, or from the Gemara in Shabbat Pechet. Nechreta ha-Torah b'ma'amakei nishmatenu. The Torah was inscribed in the depths of our neshama. Ve'ata, and now, ka'asher inenu tzrichim nashuv li'imei alumeinu. And now when we need to renew our youth, and the steps of our national rejuvenation is being heard uh, in our hearts, so we, are, we return to this very serious event. עוד הפעם איננו עומדים סוף כל סוף לקבל את התורה מתוך כפיית הר כגיגית בתור סם החיים של תחיית האומה ובניינה בארצה. It says now when we started our national, um, national rejuvenation, we need to again go back in time to some extent and to accept the Torah with some kind of a coercion. אולי לא נעים לנו הדבר, maybe it's not so pleasant. אילו היה תלוי בחפצנו הפשוט, if it was depends only on our will, אפשר שהיינו בוחרים בקבלה כזו שבה החוק רצון חופשי. We will choose probably to accept it willingly, שאנחנו חושבים אותו ליותר אידיאלי, because we think it's even more ideal. Now, don't forget, Rav Kook, who was in the beginning of the 20th century, 
the idea of choosing, it was more prevalent, obviously, than in the fourth century, not as prevalent as in the 21st century. For us, it's everything is choice. You know, don't push me, don't force me, don't tell me what to do. But we think, Rav Kook says, even in the beginning of the 20th century, that we think that something that we accept willingly is more ideal than accepting it by force. It says, says, but it's not what you see. It's not true in reality. It's not more ideal than accepting it by coercion. Lama? Why? We just see the shining um, uh, surface of things, but we don't see the deeper meaning of things. But the divine wisdom, as he said and everything stood, he may said it at Mifalotea be a soda metziut of the Atsuntashel Avaya al Pia Mitatan. Hashem knows the true meaning of everything. He yodat, meaning the divine wisdom knows. We are weak. We are weak. We, are, we, don't, we don't have such a strong will. Also our ideals. You know, sometimes today we have this ideal, tomorrow we have a different one. So Rav Kook suggested the following. He says, look, to accept something willingly is wonderful. It sounds great, especially for the new generation. But you know what? If you really know yourself, you know that it's not enough. We know that how many times we accepted upon ourselves to do something and we had an ideal and it lasted for 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours, maybe a month, maybe a year, and then it faded away. In order to cement our obligation and our commitment to the acceptance of the Torah, we must have coercion. We need to know that, there is a, that we accepted it in a situation that you cannot get out of it. It does not require your consent. We, it was wonderful that we accepted it, but that was not enough. We needed guarantors or a guarantee based on the different two sources. <clears throat> we needed to what to have uh, acceptance by force because if not, Hashem could not rely on us that we will continue on with our commitment to Torah. So Rav Kook in a way says that the coercion is because of human weakness, because of human deficiency. We needed something that will force us to accept. Okay, that's Rav Kook. Um, I will not take questions now. I just want to contrast it with Rav Salovechik. Rav Salovechik says the following. Am iskim lehikana leratzon Hashem ketotza'a mimasa umatan chofshi bein Moshe levein ha'am kpi mesupar batura. Meaning the nation was uh, willing to submit himself to Hashem's will as a result of this negotiation between Moshe and the people, as it's the Torah described. But the Talmud says, Rav Salovechik, in a very uh, brisker way and method, split it. He says, look, there is Kabbalat Torah and there is Kabbalat Abrit. Kabbalat Torah was done willingly, as the Torah described, which was God had a discussion with Moshe, Moshe had a discussion with the people, the people said, Naseh Nishma, wonderful. However, after the covenant was signed and sealed, the, sign, the, the covenant between the Jewish people and, and, the, uh, and, the, and, the, and Hashem, then the Kfiya was after the Brit was signed. We need to know that this Brit will not be broken. God demands from the community, from, meaning from the Jewish community, two obligations. 
האחת היא כללית, לציית לרצון השם. One is, that, one is general to uh, obey God's will, והשנייה היא התחייבות כלפי כל חוק וחוק. And the second one is an obligation regarding every detail. ההתחברות השנייה נתקבלה מתוך כפייה. The second obligation was accepted through coercion. הטעם להכנסת גורם הכפייה, and the reason to insert the, um, the ingredient or the factor of coercion, הוא שאיש הברית חש שאלוקים כופה עליו או מכניע אותו אף בשעה שהוא פועל כבן חורין. This is obviously, um, like all other Rabbi Salovechik's uh, ideas are a little heavy, so we need to try to break it apart and to try to, uh, to really understand it. And uh, I would like to suggest, Rav Kook looks at that in, through the prism of Torah Shebikhtav and Torah Shebalpe. When you read Torah Shebikhtav, you don't see that God had to force the Jewish people to accept the Torah. They said, Naseh v'nishma, and Moshe went up and went down and went up and went down, and everything is wonderful. Only the Gemara, it's really not only the Gemara, it's already in the Mechilta of Rabbi, Shimon, of Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai. You see the notion of kfiyah, of coercion, of force. And Rav Salovechik says the following, he says, look, the Brit and everything was more in general terms. You know, do you want to be God's nation? Sure. Do you want to have uh, ethics and morals and to be good people and to be the chosen people? Sure, sounds good, you know. But now when we go to the details, then people are like, ah, you know, I'm not sure. Is that really in the general concept? And God demands two obligations, two commitments. One is the idea of the general concept of God's uh, kingdom and, and uh, Malchut Shamayim. But then you need to have, and that's you need to be forced to accept and perform all the little details. Because some of them are not as pleasant as just to say, oh yeah, I'm sure I believe in God and it's wonderful and it's, uh, I'm an ethical person, but I don't do any, you know, any of the details. The details are sometimes are uh, the, what I will call, are uh, the indication. It's really sometimes the indication of how committed you are. And that's the component of coercion, according to Rav Salovechik. So it's not because so much of human weakness, like Rav Kook. Rav Salovechik suggests a different idea. He's not, he doesn't talk about women or a men's weakness. He talks about human weakness. He talks about the idea that that's what God wants. God wants these two things. He wants you to accept him willingly in general, and then to have coercion on the details so he knows that it's going to be done. I see someone ask a question. God cannot divorce for us because we took us by force. Like, everything is not allowed to divorce except in some, some step by step. Okay, that might be. Um, so that was not a question, it was more, more of an observation. Now, if we go to, not uh, one second, share screen. So now, that was Rav Salovechik. Now, take a look at the Gemara in Shabbat, Pechet. So Amar Chizkiya, Ma'i dikhtiv mishamay mishmat adin eretz yara v'shakata. So it's pasuk in Teilim, that uh, God, you sounded judgment from Shamaim, and then the earth, Yara, was afraid v'shakata. So the Gemara asked the question, im Yara, lama shaketa? V'im shakta, lama yarea? So the, the earth was quiet and fearful. So if it was fearful, why it was silent? And if it was silent, why it was fearful? Why do we need both? Ela batchila yara u levasof shakta. So at the beginning, it's what? At the beginning, the earth was afraid, and after that, it was quiet, it came down. And why the earth was afraid? Why do we need to have should say Yom Shishi. Hashem made a condition with the creation that if the Jewish people accept the Torah, great, and if not, 
they are going to be dissolved. So obviously, again, you see what? Be dissolved. See an, interesting, an interesting coercion, an interesting discussion here between God and, er, and, the, and nature, and basically creates this correlation between the Jewish people and, and nature. Now, what does that mean? So take a look um, at the Sfatimet. The Sfatimet says the following, avadim, avadaihem, veshon kaful. You know, the Torah says in Parashat Beha when it comes to talk about the Eved Ivri, it says, Lo aved, that you cannot buy him to be your slave, but he's really, is an employee. He says, why? Avadim avadai em. So that's obviously superfluous. If they are Bnei Israel Avadim, li Bnei Israel Avadim, so obviously avadai em. So that's superfluous. So why do we need it? Um, so Sfat Emet says the following. It says that the Jewish people are my servants. That's from Hashem's perspective. So Avadaihem, it's we accepted God. And it's from Hashem's perspective choosing us. Hashem chose you and you chose Hashem. And more we accept Hashem as our master, then we distance ourselves more and more from lo im keru mim keret avid. So basically the Sfat Emet said something very interesting. And he said, look, the idea is, is that you need to have two, it's, it's a two-way street. There is the first idea is Hashem chose us. And in a way, we have no option. If you were born Jewish, you cannot be un-Jewish. You know, it's not like mute and unmute, okay? Like what we do with Zoom. I can't be Jewish and then I'm un-Jewish. You can't do that. You can act as a non-religious Jew. You can convert. You can do many things. But Israel shechata, Israel, you can't change it. You're a chote. In God's eyes, you're Jewish who, who went off the road. Yeah, yeah, but you're still Jewish. You, can, you can't change it. You are a Jew. A Jew is a Jew. Is. So the thing is, is priest, that there, a... that's where there is a coercion. To some extent, if I don't want to be a Jew, I really have no options. However, God did it. He created this framework, but he ex wants us to do what? To now accept it willingly. Meaning after God put you in prison, you need to be a happy prisoner. Now, I obviously describe it in the wrong way because God wants us to discover that we are not in prison. Exactly the opposite. Even though God put us in somewhat of a framework, this framework allows us to blossom, to flourish, to be the best people we can. And that's what the Sfat Emet says, more you learn, more you quote-unquote enslave yourself to Hashem, you become a better and a free person. Okay, you don't want to unmute yourself. Okay, you don't, the best free person is whom? Is someone who is engaged with Torah learning. Meaning the more you freely want to become a Shem servant, you become more free. And that's why you need the coercion and the accepting it willingly. Meaning the coercion basically established the fundamentals of relationship between Hashem and the Jewish people. That was coercion. But after that, after you are, you are stuck and you are a Jew, and that's it. Now you need to learn how to what? How to say in a way, I don't want to do anything else besides being Hashem's servant. So that's why you need to have this duality in terms of 
coercion and accepting it uh, freely. And now, if we talk about cherut, um, freedom, and choice, obviously we need to understand American Judaism, right? Now, uh, Understanding American Judaism is a, an interesting book. Um, and there is something very interesting there regarding our issue. So it says the following, authority, as it is most generally understood, has re reference to the basic social fact that individuals are differentiated with respect to the possibility of their affecting each other's conduct. The religious specialist is said to have sacred authority because he legitimizes authority in terms of an ultimate value system and because he's able to affect the behavior of others so that it will be in accordance with his, this system of ultimate values. There are three aspects of the authority of religious specialists which should be kept in mind. So he talks about you know, every specialist in whatever area has like uh, fundamentals of values. So the religious specialist also has three. A, the manner in which this authority is legitimated by a claim of a direct communion with the transcendental order. Meaning we come and we tell you, look, God said this, God said that, or we think that God said this or that. We need to know that when I tell you that as a rabbi, I need to know that it's what, that he has a direct communion with this trans transcendental, transcendental order. The second is the type of kind of authority that the religious specialist possesses. Imperative authority characterized by the possibility of applying organized relatively specific sanctions which include use of coercion or influential authority. That will be a more of a modern way to say coercion, which by hereditary and exemplary conduct involves the imposition of an unorganized diffuse sanctions. Third, the extent of the authority of the religious specialist, how many individuals act in accordance with the rules he imposes. Okay. So what do you have to say about these three fundamentals and how they relate to what we spoke about? I need to breathe. So please unmute yourself and share your ideas. Bill, please. I find this fascinating because it's all symbolic. Uh, none of the people, the Chachamim of the different generations were there personally though they made claim we were all there, but I don't think we took photographs or anything of the sort. So they're really talking about rabbinic authority, including down to our day, Rav Salvechik. And the answer is, we are Jews. You were asked earlier, um, by what authority did they, did, do they say that the Jews at Har Sinai could judge us and bind us to follow what contemporary rabbis say and do? And the answer is, this is almost a political statement, a, a statement that God runs the world, this is what he wants, and these are his representatives. And a big discussion about whether the mountain went up or they went down, or it was sunny and shady, or they were threatened, are all different ways of saying, how far do we go with religion and who controls it? Hey. Very good. Yeah, Paul. Okay, I, I, two things. First of all, there's a difference between a Brit and a Jose. A Brit, okay, uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs mentions it a number of times in a number of his books. The Brit, it's not a, it's not a contract. It's really from Rav Salavetic, by the way. Probably, I don't know. <laughs> okay, that's number one. Number two, there's a two-way process. One is top-down and one is bottom-up. One is, if you like, Yira and one is Ahava, okay? I'm not sure that's a, a, a correct uh, comparison. But when it comes to obeying rules, obeying a constitution, it's got to come in two ways. It's got to be, yes, that's what the country wants, but you have to try and understand where the consensus is to get from bottom down to accept what is being, what is being, uh, what is being uh, given to you. Um, I think here with the Torah, it's similar. It's not the same, it's similar because a Torah is a much more in, uh, wider um, set of values than 
obeying the rules in a, in a government. Okay, very good. So as you see, you know, we can take those statements and that's why it was so important for me to give you at the beginning the, some of the historical background, especially in the third and fourth century, which was really, um, I would say, it shaped, to some extent, it shaped the, some of the major perspective that we have until today. Uh, there is no, um, you know, there is no surprise that Trava, for example, that I mentioned to you before in the first source, is mentioned hundreds of times in the Talmud Bavli in major intersection when it comes to halacha and parshanut. Uh, to the extent, by the way, some of the Chokrim says that there were two Rava, one Rava in the fourth generation and one Rava in the seventh generation as a Svorai. We're not going to go into it and the proofs against it, for it, whatever. But the idea is that Rava is a halachic decisor, it's a, he's a parshan, is very, very involved. And when you understand that he is living among Sasanians and that they push also different religions, it's, uh, you understand the depth of what he had to say and the willingness and the interpretation and that not everything is set in stone, but at the same time, you need to have authority to do it. So we are moving between authority, obedience, freedom of, th of thought, yeah, innovation, um, reaction to different, uh, to different realities. So this is also, you know, sometimes, and criticism from, as we say in Memphis, from y'all. Okay, as rabbis, you are pushed from the bottom. You thought, Paul, you talked about bottom up, top, uh, top bottom. You know, rabbis are stuck because on one hand, there is tremendous pressure from God to do the right thing. And then you have the pressure from the people to move forward. So we are stuck in between, sometimes like the Kohanim, are we Shluchei Rachmana or Shluchei Didan? You know, who are we? And this is, this is where, you know, sometimes the push uh, is very strong and the rabbis needs to react and sometimes the rabbis needs to be proactive. So this is, by the way, I'm, I'm not doing now a therapy session for rabbis, but the idea is, is that I think the rabbis really, I think, try to convey to the people really all the messages that we are talking about. We are talking about authority, we're talking about obedience, at the same time we are talking about freedom of interpretations. And then, you know, how you continue on the, the Torah to future generations. So in order to conclude this idea and really to conclude the shiur as well, is that I want to share with you this midrash, which I think is fascinating. And this midrash is very daring, I would say. Again, from Shmot Rabbah. Now this is Shmot Rabbah, again, it's a late midrash. Uh, again, it was probably in the 11th, 12th century. Uh, was edited, not saying written, it was edited and some of it was even written. They, they had a lot of, tra of uh, ancient traditions and they put it together. And it says the following, Rashi shared Rabbi Lazar by Rabbi Yossi. Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai, again, he asked Rabbi Lazar by Rabbi Yossi, Can you please explain to me the Pasuk in Shir Ashirim that says that, um, that um, uh, Atara Shitra Lo Imo, the glory or the crown that um, Shlomo Amelech's mom gave him? What does that mean? As a Marlo Hen, yeah, I heard something from my father. What does that mean? As a Marlo Hen, yeah, I heard something from my father. It's a, it's a parable to a king that had an only daughter. He loved her so much. He called her my daughter. After that, he called her my sister. Until he called her my mother. What does that mean? At the beginning, Hashem called the Jewish people Bat, my daughter. She named her Shimi Bat Uri. See, but my daughter. After that, he loved them so much and he called them my sister. God loved us so much until he called us our, my mother, so to speak. So Rush stood up and he gave a kiss to Rablazar Berabios. What, what's going on here? We can, I can speak about this midrash for an hour, but we don't have an hour. We have three minutes, so I'll try to do my best. We can learn this midrash in different ways. I would like to suggest to you the following, the following way. There are three stages here. There is Bat, my daughter, my sister, and then my mother. What's the difference? So my daughter, my little child, is someone that I lead. 
my sister, Ach, Achot, is someone that it's more equal. Imi is someone who gave you birth. There's no, there's no equality there. That's someone who gave you birth. What does it mean that Hashem says to us that we are his mother? It makes no sense. It's against everything we believe in, obviously. God has no shape, no form. We didn't give him birth. We didn't give him life. So what does it mean? I would like to say that it's three stages in Torah learning and the continuation of the Jewish people. When the Jews left Mitzrayim, they were like bat, like a daughter, like a small child. God took us by hand. After that, we accepted the Torah. We became more of a partners with God. Achot, ach, achot, on more of an equal base. But after that, we became a mother. We start giving life to Torah. Not only to obey, not only to quote unquote be equal, but also to innovate. To give to, to new generation. We are talking about creating, not creating, but perpetuating Torah values to future generations in a way of giving life to something that already exists. God gave us the koach, the power, to create new things. The prime example that we all know is Rosh Chodesh, the first mitzvah that the Jewish people were given as a nation. To the extent that the Midrashim and the Gemara, they all talk about the idea that Chazal has the power to change nature by declaring the month based on this day or the other day. And even if we have mistake, a mistake, God accepted that mistake because he gave us the power. So again, it goes back to the power of the rabbis. We are giving life, and it's not only the power of the rabbis, by the way, it's also power of every, every Torah learner, is that you give life to an ancient text, you give life to something that is old and ancient, and you rejuvenate it, you renew it. You make it relevant to your life. So the idea is, according to this last Midrash that we see, I think it brings it all together. I think it also depends of, on the stages where we are. Sometimes there is a stage in our life that we know, you know what, without the coercion and the guilt and the commitment, we will not continue on to be so committed. And sometimes we find in our days and our, based on our knowledge and, and understanding that sometimes, you know, even if we will not... Uh, forced to do it, we would love to do mitzvot, or we would love to learn Torah, or we would love to do whatever we love to do. So I think we need both. And I think maybe this is a, a, a better understanding for Shavuot. We really have both. We have coercion, based on maybe our human weakness, or because of the two brito that God demands from us, or because more we learn and more we know, we, let, we feel less, we, sorry, we feel less uh, less, um, less enslaved, but also the idea that we have three stages and we need to go from a daughter to a sister and then to become a mother, to really be able to give life to ancient text and to bring it to us as the most relevant, uh, most uh, interesting, most important thing in our life. So uh, with that, I will wish you Shabbat Shalom. I uh, will see, I know at least, uh, I think the majority of you, uh, tonight at 7.30 p.m. for my Midrash class on Parashat Shavua. Um, everyone should uh, continue to be healthy and safe, and I will uh, see you soon. Bezrat Hashem. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hmm?